Good morning, everyone. Very warm welcome to our 10.15 service, as it feels, to our bodies, as we've had an extra hour in bed or an extra hour up with the young children, depending on which life stage you're at. Very warm welcome to St. George's. For some of you here, it's your first time ever. For some of you here, it's your first time in a long time. And for some of you here, you're here every week. Well, wherever you are in those categories, know that you are really, really welcome. We are a church that believes that Jesus Christ is Lord. And what we do as we gather here week by week is we worship him. We draw close to him by his spirit through his word. And we share times of fellowship and prayer together because we know how much we need God with us. And we'll be doing exactly the same this morning. Just a couple of quick announcements before we start. The first is to say that this afternoon we've got an alternative to a Halloween party, a light party, because we don't want to be celebrating the dark things of Halloween. We want to be celebrating Jesus, the light of the world. So families, are you signed in for this? Some of you are. I had a look this morning. There were 23 places. Please don't just turn up, but go online and book in on the church suite. There's some of these flyers at the back, and uh, you'll be able to take one of these. Book yourselves in, and we'll see you this afternoon for the light party. Secondly, this evening, a very poignant service that we've got called A Time to Remember. It's it's essentially a service that we invite a load of people to whose funerals we've been involved in, or their family, I should say, whose funeral we've been involved in over the last couple of years. So if you're someone who has loved someone and lost someone recently or a long time ago and just want to give thanks to God for them and remember them in a church service tonight, then do come along to this. It's our evening service tonight at 6.30. Some of you that will be appropriate for. Others of you, it won't be you at all, but it'd be really helpful because we've invited a load of people who don't usually come to church. It'd be great if we had a church full when they arrived. So maybe think about just coming along to support and to cheer on those who are grieving and to be with them tonight. So that's happening tonight at 6.30. And finally, just a quick heads up about the Christmas choirs. Uh, we, we've got two Christmas choirs this year, one for the children, which Liz Power will be in contact with you about, and one for the adults to lead our carols by candlelight. Those choir rehearsals start tomorrow evening. Do speak to either Sam Holbird or the church office if you want to find out more about those. Well, if you're willing and able, why don't you stand with me? Our opening sentence this morning says this, God has come to help his people. Maybe you feel like you're in need of some help this morning. Well, good news, God has come to help his people. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the cross. Thank you that Jesus died for us. Thank you that through the cross and Jesus' resurrection, you have helped your people and thank you that by your spirit you continue to help us and as we worship you now father we want to lift this whole service to you and pray that you would use this service to shape us to be more like jesus in whose name we pray amen thanks jim Oh, 
We thank you that you have, your victory is endless, that you have conquered death. There is nothing to fear in life or death in you. We praise you, Father.
we've come to the point in the service where we uh, acknowledge that all the good gifts that are given to us ultimately find their source in God. And therefore, anything that we give to support the work and ministry of this church find their root in him. And whether we give through the little wooden box by the door or through the standing order system of the bank, we acknowledge that, Lord, everything we have comes from you. Please use our gifts to build your kingdom. When the Lord comes, he will bring to light things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Therefore, in the light of Christ, let us confess our sins. We say together, Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us to amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. May the God of all healing and forgiveness draw us to himself and cleanse us from all our sins, that we may behold the glory of his Son, the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's say together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And Heavenly Father, we pray for our young people and children as they now leave for their activities. Might you be with them just as you will remain here with us. Amen. Well, we've come to that time. If you've got a wristband on, you're already signed in, you can just go with the yellow coats. If you're new to St. George's, you've brought children or young people with you and you want to sign them in, do go over with them to make sure they're signed in and then uh, you can leave them. We've got creche, children's groups, youth groups, all the way through 0 to 14. So do go over and sign them in for that. Great. We're going to carry on in prayer here, and uh, I think, Steve, are you going to come and lead us in prayer? Let's pray together. So let's pray. We'll start with uh, Thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, as unworthy servants, we give you most humble and hearty thanks for your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we ask that you would give us a heightened sense of your mercies so that our hearts would be truly and fully thankful and that we show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but also in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Now we'll move on to pray about some of the big issues in our world. We commit to you, Lord, the leaders of nations. We live in a time of increasing uncertainty, the consequences of which are wars, famine, increased hardship for many in our world. We pray that leaders would forsake their goals of personal aggrandizement and enrichment 
and instead come to commit to serving their people, particularly the weak and the vulnerable. We pray for a new sense of service to pervade our own government and the leadership of many states around the world. We pray that you would intervene to thwart the plans of the wicked and to save and uplift the people of peace, particularly in places of open conflict. Let's remember those whom we support in foreign locations, the Ngoroks in Uganda, the Brits in Turkey, and others uh, in different parts of the world and in the UK. Bless and strengthen them in their endeavour to serve you and surround them with your holy angels of protection. And we thank you for bringing Mo Power safely home as she had to return unexpectedly from uh, Uganda. We lift to you King Charles, our new king, and ask that you would draw close to him and that he would come increasingly to recognise you as his saviour, redeemer and guide. We pray for your church in this time of increased uncertainty, that we would shine for you in our daily lives. Be a witness to your love and redeeming grace. We pray too for the staff team at St George's, that you would protect and inspire them. Give them new energy, new passion for you, and a wonderful knowledge of your presence with them through your Holy Spirit. We pray that you'd continue to bless and inspire the plans to grow new dynamic congregations in Spalding, Boston and Grantham, so that your name would be lifted high in those communities. We pray for our own community here in Stamford. We pray for those amongst us who are suffering in different ways, through illness, bereavement, struggles with the dramatic increases in the cost of living, unemployment and any other kind of adversity. In a moment of quiet, let's remember those known to us who are struggling particularly at this time. Lord, we lift to you each of these people that we've named in our hearts. Please bring them your comfort, your peace, and your healing as they need it. We humbly ask all these things in the name of our gracious Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand together to uh, sing again.
Death could not hold you. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the ghost of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring. The praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. And you have no So we see Jesus' power over death. We see him confronted with death and it's, it's nothing compared to him. And so I thought we'd just sing um, this chorus, which is a, a new chorus, but it's very simple. i have sing it a few times. It just reminds us of Jesus' power over darkness, that his name is a light that the shadows can't deny. Um, so yeah, we'll sing it a few times and, and join in when you can. Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. You silence fear, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Sing that again. Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. You silence fear, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Your name is a light. Your name is a light that the shadows can't deny. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name is a life forever lifted high. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name is a light. Your name is a light that the shadows can't deny. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, you silenced the ghost of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again, and you have no right. Yours is the key. 
giants died against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Amen. Do please take your seats and as you do so, grab one of these blue Bibles if you haven't brought a Bible with you. Uh, Leslie's going to introduce our reading in just a moment. So you'll find it in Luke chapter uh, seven. 7. Luke chapter 7. My mic's just gone, but mic's is on. <laughs> no, it wasn't on here. Luke <laughs> chapter 7. Um, let me just introduce Mike and Leslie to you because not everyone will know them. Claire's got Bibles at the back. Give her a wave if you need one. Um, uh, Leslie and Mike moved to Stanford about six months ago. And uh, they've been involved historically in church planting stuff elsewhere, which is, I think is one of the reasons that attracted them to come to this particular church. And that church planting has taken them not only to different places in the UK, but also India as well. And uh, Mike is going to be preaching for us this morning, but it's his first time preaching, so we want to make him feel really welcome. First time here, I should explain, not his first time <laughs> preaching. Uh, Leslie's going to read our reading for us now. So let's turn to Luke 7 together. Thanks, Leslie. In the Blue Bibles, 1035, as Ben said, uh, the reading is from Luke 7, verse 11. Jesus raises a widow's son. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the bier that they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. And the dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared amongst us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. This is me getting prepared, by the way. Several important factors. Firstly, um, I love telling stories, but my wife has told me that uh, there's only 20 minutes. So um, I've also brought my phone uh, so it can go ding at the right moment. Um, because it's very important today to do justice to the scripture we have here. So let's pray. Father God, we just want to lift Jesus high. Thank you that we've been doing that this morning with, with these super songs that we've been rising to you. But Lord, we have your word here to uh, open up now. And we ask that it may become life to every single person in this room. And to every single person uh, listening uh, on the internet as well. Holy God, have your way in our midst today, we pray. Amen. Well, folks, I better get on then. I am so pleased I have this passage because it's a passage about breakthrough. And I'm afraid you're going to hear that word several times today, or more than several. Um, and I would like to therefore point out to you that to talk theoretically about God bringing breakthrough is a crazy thing. I am talking today about the Lord bringing breakthrough in your life and my life and the life of everybody who's going to listen to this at some other point. Because this word was written not just for our instruction, but so that we could be changed, and that so Jesus could be glorified. So let's have a closer look, though, at what the passage tells us. So we need to start visualizing what's going on 
beforehand and how everything comes about now. Jesus has been uh, in uh, Capernaum. It has gone fantastically in Capernaum. And the servant of a Roman officer has got dramatically healed. The result is that a whole bunch of people have gathered around Jesus. Um, it's not just his disciples who then leave Capernaum. And Jesus, as he's coming around the lake, is going to hit a little town called Nain. Not a very famous town and only re known today because of what's going to happen next. Uh, and so you can imagine a kind of snowballing effect. Uh, they heard his teaching in uh, Luke chapter 6. They've seen a work of power uh, at the beginning of the chapter. And now, wow, what's going to happen in Nain? So there's a faith-filled group of people leaving one place. Uh, and we can see that um, in verse 11. But in verse 12, meanwhile, another crowd is forming. And that's forming up around a funeral. The only child, the only son of a widow has died. We are told this so that we understand that this is all that woman had. The only child. She's not going to have another son or daughter. And her neighbors will be there, of course. Now, we don't know how rich or poor this lady was. But if she was very rich, uh, there would have been hired mourners there. Um, hired to make a lot of noise. But whether she was rich or poor, it was the duty of her neighbors to also join in. And so this is a Middle Eastern funeral. It's noisy and very sad. Um, and they're just getting to the gates at the point that Jesus and his, shall we say, gang, also arrives. So firstly, we need to understand that what both crowds were experiencing was very real and it was significant. It, uh, at no point are we going to say, oh, well, actually, you know, it wasn't too bad. You know, it's only just a death. And the other one, we're going to say, oh, it was just so holy that, you know, things like that don't matter. But we can see that there's going to be a clash of crowds. There's also going to be a clash of kingdoms. And out of that will come a breakthrough. And out of what we see from how Jesus acts, we can um, discover ways we can act ourselves, but also things that mean something to you and me as we seek breakthroughs in our own lives or as we seek breakthroughs for our loved ones. Now, so at this point, Jesus has some choices to make. He could say, oh, well, just after you. Or, or, or me and my group will just filter past you. But he wasn't some kind of heavenly tour guide. Um, he was somebody who now um, was seeking to manifest the kingdom of God upon earth. Why were they going out the gate, by the way? They were going out the gate because it was illegal to bury people inside a town or city. Um, and the Romans particularly enforced that. That's why if you go to Italy and you go down the Via Appia, you'll find tombs, 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 tombs all the way down. So they had to get out and it was a legal requirement that they do so. Also, Judaism required same-day burial. Uh, so there was a sense of urgency about those departing. And the one thing not on their mind was anything improving the situation. That's so often how it is before we have a breakthrough. The word would be meaningless, wouldn't it, if we had a breakthrough every Tuesday? It would be meaningless if we had a breakthrough every day in our lives or in our ministries or in our jobs or in our health. Um, but actually, what precedes breakthrough is usually something that looks very like not breakthrough. Do you get what I mean? Where it looks pretty bad often. And here, there is no expectation on one crowd of actually anything good coming of what they see. I'm sure everybody would have been trying to comfort the, the mother um, and she'll have heard a lot of platitudes by that stage. I don't know about you, but um, uh, I've experienced a lot of death in my life and bereavement. And um, one of the hardest things to handle sometimes is what people say to you. You know, everybody's trying to help um, and you know they are, but it doesn't seem to touch uh, the inner core of your own grief. Um, uh, and I don't know why I had to have so much experience in the area, but um, 
the result is that I've learned to cut people some slack, not being the kind of person who normally does so. Um, so let's look at what Jesus actually does now in verse 13. Because when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't try. Well, there's actually three things there, and please bear with me, um, because it may seem simplistic to you. First of all, I think he really saw her. He really saw her. Have you ever been with people who are chatting with you, but actually they're, they're looking over the side of you? I didn't even set my alarm on, by the way. You'll have to check me by then. Uh, but I, you can see they're looking for somebody better than you to talk to in the same conversation. Oh, uh, oh I've just seen Larry. Bye. Um, Jesus saw her. Remember, this is a son himself. This is a son who knows that his mother is going to see him upon the cross. This is a son who knows that his mother will face the, um, a closed tomb. So he's got a lot of compassion for mothers. And he saw her. Her in specific. I mean, it's all this racket that was going on. And of course, his lot are probably being annoyingly cheery. Hey, isn't it great? Everything's going well. As they come up the hill, and as the other lot go down the hill, they're, they're so noisy you can't even think but the noise of grief. So his heart goes out to her, and he utters something that could be seen as very simplistic or banal. Don't cry. Don't cry. Personally, when I hear those words, I find it actually very touching because of what I've just said uh, about um, Jesus and his mother. It, it, if he'd only stopped there, however, Jesus would have gone no further than most of us do. Most of us are capable of seeing somebody else's pain. It's just whether we do anything about it that matters. Most of us are capable of having our heart go out to somebody else. You've done that before, haven't you? Most of us um, are capable of saying something uh, when we see the awfulness of some realities of life. But Jesus actually goes beyond that. And that's why it's such a privilege to be preaching this particular passage. Although I turned over the page too early. See, the danger is of thinking that's all we have to offer other people and all that God has to offer us. Let's go to church and just cheer up a bit. I'm afraid that's not what we're here. We are about a clash of kingdoms where the kingdom of God's beloved son starts to rule over life, circumstance, society, and reality. So it's not a cheap remark because we see what it leads to. He touches that beer. A beer is like a stretcher. Uh, uh, it's like a... Um, a litter for carrying people in. Um, they were quite high up, um, and he just touches it. That causes the, the, the men who are hefting it along to suddenly stop. Have you seen people carrying a beer into a church? It's as radical as stopping that funeral procession as it's just about to enter the religious building. But this, they see the authority in Jesus... Uh, probably a bit surprised and shocked as well, but they stop. They were very surprised also because Jesus would have been seen as a rabbi, a teacher, a holy man, and death was a defiling thing. This is true, by the way, in India today. Um, I've seen people walking past a dying or dead person um, because if you touch that person, not only do you become defiled and you have to spend a lot of money on a Hindu priest um, de-defiling you, I believe that's a word, um, but also you assume uh, the cost of their funeral and their, the, the other related provisions if you touch that body. Um, so this isn't quite that, but nonetheless it was a defining thing to touch something to do with death. They were surprised, they stopped, but it's even more surprising what happens next the Lord speaks a word of faith. Young man, I say to you, get up. 
Well, that's crazy, isn't it? How can he hear? I think we could spend a long time on that one. But that's what Jesus says. Young man, I say to you, get up. We don't know how old this, uh, this person was. But I can tell you this. Um, to the mother, she was still, he was still a boy. I lost my brother when I was 17. When he was 17, I was 18. In my last conversation with my mother, 73 years later, she was still grieving for her little boy. She didn't see Andy as a 17-year-old. She saw him as her little one. And the word young man here can be uh, translated to mean you know, little one or younger one. But folks, what I'm asking you to do now is not just to hear the verse. I'm asking you to see the life in it and maybe live it for yourself. Because this is Jesus going beyond mere compassion for you and me, but doing something about it. And we either worship a Jesus who can and will act on our behalf. I wish I understood how and when. You know, that would be a step forward, wouldn't it? Because actually, the word of God says the secret things belong to our God, but the promises are for us and for our children. So easy to say, I don't understand, so I won't act. That won't take you very far. Go into the promises of God. I have preached that at every single funeral I've ever conducted. The secret things belong to God, but the promises are for us and for our children. There will never be any, you will never understand everything about the ways of God. You will never understand the timing of God. You will never understand why this had to happen before that happened next. Please don't waste effort in your lives attempting to do so. However, let's look at the example we have in Christ. The Lord is speaking a word of faith over you today. Yeah, you. Because I, I fail to believe that God could be interested in Roman centurion servants, widows in uh, early Palestine, and then suddenly lose interest when it comes to people in Stamford. Do you see what I'm getting at? That God is not a favoritist, including for anybody behind any pillar and anybody on the thing. This includes clergy. This includes leadership. God is on your case, and God has something to say to each person in this room. Not each person, minus some. Do you understand what I'm getting at here? It's so easy to think that the Lord wants to improve things for somebody else. My wife's given me the look which says, calm down. <laughs> Works as well. Very briefly, usually. Um, verse 15. The dead man sat up and began to talk. And then it says, Jesus reached up to him and gave him back to his mother. I interpret that to mean he was a bit wobbly. And finding things all a little bit too much. You would do if you'd been dead. Um, so that is the whole story. It doesn't just stop a compassion and a tender word. So Jesus speaks the word of life over that young man and hands him back a life worth living. Jesus speaks the word of faith over your life and he hands you back a life worth living, however much you thought it was not beforehand. So he is the Lord of Oakham and Stamford and Oundel as well as Caesarea, as well as Capernaum or Nain. Now, I need to be, avoid being overly symbolic here because let's be real. Did Jesus stop every funeral beer in Palestine every day? He did not. Did he um, did bring every dead young person back to life? I'm afraid he didn't. Other mo mo mothers did continue to mourn. And mothers continue to mourn today. What we need to grasp is the nature of God's heart in this scripture. His disposition was and is to bring breakthrough for you and for me. However, all of us have our time where we will be called home. And we will be called to give account before the Lord. 
We do not control that. That is one of the secret things. But the outcome here is that God gets glory and praise. Well, that's not terribly surprising, is it? Um, They were all filled with awe. Well, I would be. Um, They all praised God. In my experience, that doesn't always happen. Um, uh, I've seen a lot of um, remarkable things uh, over the years. And I find people's willingness to praise God depends upon how bitter or, and twisted they are already. I, I, I've seen people heal of cancer and, and not praising God for it. Um, but here they did. Um, they drew some conclusions. And here is the verse I asked to be put in the thing, in the uh, email. God has come to help his people. That's the conclusion they drew. What a great conclusion to draw, folks. God has come to help his people. God has come to help his people. This good news always spreads, and that's what we found in verse 17. Throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Now, I'd like to give you an example um, from my own life of this kind of clash of kingdoms. Um, It was also a clash of crowds, which is what brought it to mind first. Um, And this exemplifies in the real world um, how um, Jesus can change things um, pretty suddenly. Um, It was my third trip to India. Uh, We'd done over 30 meetings already in eight days. It had been very tough. Uh, I did one meeting. Uh, It was uh, five small children, two old men, in a derelict building. And we had to use the Jeep's headlights in order to illuminate my Bible to share. Um, uh, I preached on top of a rubbish dump. um, And when we lay out the tarpaulin to begin with, I was thinking, well, where are all the people? Um, And they said, never mind, never mind. Um, uh, Just get going. And then... It was like a horror film. Out from what looked like just rubbish, people started rising. They'd been actually hiding underneath cardboard or or, or tarpaulin or or corrugated iron. And what amazed me was how clean everybody was. These were people who were living in a rubbish dump. And eventually about 100 people came uh, to gather around to hear the, the gospel. Um, but nonetheless, it, it w- was challenging, and I won't bore you with all, all the other the, the challenging aspects to that. Um, so we were on the last day, we were due to get a very early morning flight out, and they'd crammed five meetings in. The first two uh, were e- very challenging. Uh, at, at the third one, um, we w- went into an all-night prayer meeting. Uh, in India, they pray all through the night every Friday. Uh, in fact, they wouldn't believe I was a Christian initially because I didn't do that. Uh, and they thought people in Britain were, were, were a bit screwed, you know, uh, in, in their thinking. But uh, nonetheless, uh, the, the pastor was lying uh, in this kind of position here. He was on a, um, uh, a beer. And as I started to re- read from the Psalms, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, um, he was healed and he just jumped up. He'd been immobilized for several weeks. And I thought, oh, this is different from all these other days. Um, but we had to leave it rapidly because um, a police inspector had just been converted. And he was a, a particularly corrupt police inspector. He was also a, a sexually violent man. Uh, and the word had got out. And um, everybody in his, where he lived was called a colony. They wanted to hear um, what earth had happened to the man. We got there. We were told, oh, you just have to bless the apartment, the flat. Uh, okay, we can manage that. Then everybody else was clamoring, you have to bless my flat. You know, because there was a bit of competition. These people weren't Christians at all. But they just saw what was happening with another chap who they were frightened of. Um, well, I said, look, this is ridiculous. Why don't I stand on the veranda and I had a share with all of you? So in the end, 250 policemen and their wives uh, were, were out there hearing the gospel. Oh, no, we're we're late for the last meeting. Oh, they'd all gone home. It was a Methodist assembly where we've been told um, uh, it'll be uh, 30 people don't say hallelujah. Uh, Yeah, 30 people don't say hallelujah. That was my entire level of instruction. 
But we, we didn't get there till 9 p.m. And in fact, what we found was that um, they'd been building a new building and everybody was on the roof um, because that was the only place big enough to take the people, 700 of them. Uh, they'd been sitting there since 7 when the meeting officially began, hoping we would get there. As we tried to enter the town, we were hit by a crowd coming the other way, just like in this. So there's four, four of us, um, various police people, all really pretty, pretty cheery. Um, but it was the Feast of Holy, H-O-L-I. Well, um, you've seen nice things where people throw paints. Well, it, it's derived from blood. Uh, and here out in the sticks, they were doing what they normally did. Uh, they would bow before the idols and then start slashing their wrists and spray the blood out. So, um, and obviously they're doing this in a frenzy. It was not pleasant. So we, we hit this crowd coming the other way uh, as we tried to work our way into the town. And do you know what? I was really keen on saying, oh, after you, after you, after you. Uh, please. Um, and that's what had happened because um, such fear was upon this town. Um, uh, that's why so many people had gathered, hoping that we had something to do that could take free them from the fear. Um, there was the mayor, um, there were the newspapers, they put up huge floodlights. This was not 30 people don't say hallelujah. Well, um, but there was so, the fear was so great you could cut it with a knife. Um, so I started to tell them about Jesus and that you could have hope in Christ. And that if they put, would put aside their idols, Jesus would heal and protect them. Um, when I gave the invitation to become a Christian, uh, 400 of those people rushed me. And I was popped up into the air like in a gig, crowd surfing. Yeah, I call that a good response to a gospel meeting. Except coming down again. As I came down, um, I thought, they obviously didn't. They weren't paying sufficient attention. So I told everybody, go back, go back. I'm going to start and take you through again about the cost of commitment. I then gave the, uh, the appeal again, and I was rushed once more. But in this case, I was thrown to the ground, and four dear Bible students kind of jumped on uh, top of me to form a, a shield to stop me being crushed by the enthusiasm of the crowd. At this point, I was thinking, this isn't like a normal British meeting at all. Um, um, but there I am, down on the ground, and I see two little disabled children, because I thought, all oh, the children, all the children, they're going to get crushed. But these two little uh, boy and girl were smiling at me. They were both disabled. And as I looked at them, they both began to unpack and their limbs became straight. If you weren't there, I'm sorry, that's what happened. Because this is the Jesus we're talking about. This is about the Jesus of breakthrough. Breakthrough looks terrible until it happens. And, do you know, we can, life can be very boring until breakthrough happens. It can be very tedious indeed. Or it can be so bad. But in this situation, it had been very, very bad. Um, just as everything was seeming to get going, the whole town had a blackout. Uh, and so here we are in pitch black. It's all right because I usually carry a head torch as a rock climber. So I stuck my head torch on thinking, I hope they've never seen a Dalek you know, because they're going to get a bit anxious. But I knew that something was happening good because I could see everybody's teeth shining in my head torch. Well, that was the beginning of Breakthrough at Maripalli. We went back the next year, and there's maybe 3,000, maybe five or 6,000 the year after. Five years later, um, we were, things had really started to move, and um, they were discussing a place where there'd been a lot of spontaneous healings of deafness. Now, I've always had a hang-up about uh, praying for people who are deaf. I have a lot of strategies for avoiding praying for them. I'm not going to share them with you, just in case I need them. Uh, and so I've typically avoided ever laying hands on a person. And they said, why are you so um, uh, hung up, Mike? Um, what about all those deaf people in Maripelli in 2006 who got healed on the, um, on the roofs around the meeting? And I said, what do you mean? 
He didn't mention any of this. This is typical, by the way, of our friends in India. You know, um, you know, and they described the same meeting that I've been describing to you, but it transpired that I could only see the people on the roof. Lots of the population had been on the adjacent roofs outside the floodlights. I'd never seen them. And every deaf person had been healed by Christ that day. Now, have a think about this. They didn't hear the talk. They didn't hear the talk. They didn't hear how marvelously somebody was preaching. Um, all they could see was some lights and what was it? It was the presence of Jesus reaching out to those people. They were, uh, nobody laid hands on them. That got me out of it. Um, nobody could take any glory for it because Jesus had done it himself. Now, that breakthrough in that town continues. They've had a daily pr prayer meeting since 2006. They, they built a prayer house in order to facilitate that. Um, my time is gone, but all I can tell you is in my last visit, um, a great-grandfather was brought to me, um, a pastor, in fact, a Methodist pastor, and I, I, through an interpreter, I said, well, you introduced me to the, these are your family. He brought his, grand, uh, his son, who had been converted that day. He brought his grandson, who had been converted in a year later, and his great-grandson, same time. Um, and I said, how are the churches? Please tell me, are the churches still standing? And he said, it's okay, Mike. Um, again, in Telugu, not English, uh, by interpretation. Um, only three pastors have been murdered, but every church that was 10 is 100, and every church that was 100 is 1,000. Don't worry, we're standing firm. Now, Put that into this passage, folks. It's only an example. I've deliberately cho chose one to stretch you and me. Um, I can't believe I was there. So I completely understand if you don't. <laughs> but I have to draw a conclusion now and, and land this plane. What do we need to do about what we're hearing? What do we need to do about the touch of Jesus in this gathering? First of all, don't say that... Um, the breakthrough you need is too small for Jesus. It's not. Don't say that the breakthrough that you need is too big for Jesus. It certainly is not. And I'm going to invite a response. I'm not going to make an appeal. That implies that Jesus is begging you for something. But I'm going to give a call to action. Because uh, the fact that I'm standing here came about through um, a discussion with the leaders really about the whole matter of uh, believers and death. There's some of you here who have a, an undue fear of death and the Lord wants to set you free from that fear um, today in this meeting from fear of death. Some of you have a, an undue expectation that all you can expect from the rest of your life is bad. God wants to break that perception in you. And that requires some kind of action which will involve standing up. You'll be glad to hear it does not involve rushing the stage because um, we're in Stanford. But this is where you're standing and it's between you and the Lord saying, yes, Lord, I want a breakthrough in my life, please. I've given you two examples, but you may be very sure of other ones that God has been dropping into your heart uh, as I've been sharing. Maybe the breakthrough is in your view of God. Has your God been too small? Is your God too small? Well, you need to upgrade. <laughs> yeah? So you need to stand before the Lord. But I'm going to warn you now that I am going to ask for some people subsequent to that to kneel. Because actually, there's an issue of surrender here, folks, as we surrender to the Lord. Maybe you need to surrender for, to Jesus for the first time. You're not quite sure whether you are a Christian or not. You're certainly you're a churchgoer, but have you surrendered to this Jesus, the Jesus who has that touch? Well, I've been asking you to kneel. But 
you're not the only people I'll be asking to kneel in a moment. I'm asking those to kneel um, who are surrendering to the Lord in other areas. And it might be an area of sin, but it does not have to be. Because actually, as we move towards greater surrender, we always discover there's the need for more surrender. But I found that it's the best ever antidote to fear of death. People who are surrendered to Jesus do not fear the Lord, uh, fear death. Um, it's a great antidote. But it, we don't do it f- to get that. We do it because he deserves our surrender. Right. So, if you are seeking a breakthrough in your life and you believe Jesus is speaking to you, please now stand. Okay, we're going to close our eyes, and I'm going to ask again, just in case people have a problem with that. Everybody close your eyes. Anybody else who's been unsure, but now knows they're not being watched, and it's between you and the Lord. Feel free to stand now. For some of you, it's a health matter. You've persevered, persevered, persevered. But the Lord's saying now is the breakthrough time for your condition. Okay, we're going to keep our eyes closed. But whether you're standing or not, you have realized that there's an issue of surrender here for you in terms of either your picture of God your need to start following him properly or to change your view of him because it's been too small. Well, whether you've been standing or you haven't been standing, I now invite you, while we keep our eyes closed, to kneel. Do it in whatever way is comfortable for you. Turn on your seat if you've got knee problems or something. Find some space if you need it. Holy God, you see us completely as we are. And the marvelous thing is you reach out and you touch us. You see our our pain and you reach out and touch. You see our sin, and you still reach out to us and touch. Holy Spirit, we ask now that you may do a work in each person that is greater than just the act of kneeling or standing. Thank you that these things are just a a pale shadow of what's being triggered in our hearts. Lord, thank you that it's not just even about the meeting that we're in, but that you give people this opportunity as they recall what you've already spoken them to. Some of you are going to do, need to do your kneeling at the foot of your bed tonight when you start wishing you'd done it earlier. Whatever it is, let's make sure that we do proper business with our Lord because then we can see the same release we saw in the breakthrough for the widow of Nain and her son. Again, let's stay quiet and focused on Jesus. Just take your places again, please. I ask for this final hymn, uh, No Fear in Death. As we sing it, you'll, you'll see why. Lord bless you all. Feel free to stay seated if you want, seated if you want to, or stand with us as we sing our final song.
In Christ alone my hope is found He is my light, my strength, my song This cornerstone, this solid ground Firm through the fiercest drought and storm No heights of love or depths of peace when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, took on flesh fullness of god in helpless pain this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as jesus died the wrath of god was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of christ i live there in the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath. of man can never pluck me from his hands till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand Do please take your seats. Friends, we've come to the end of our service, but church isn't finished today. We've got plenty of time now to uh, talk to one another, to continue in prayer. Uh, we've got a prayer ministry team. I'm sure Mike would be willing to join that team today as well to pray for anyone for whom God has just particularly spoke to you today and you just want to continue in prayer with someone else alongside you, then uh, please don't rush off. Please find someone that you love and trust or someone wearing one of the red lanyards or one of the team here we'd be delighted to pray with you those of you who've got children over in cheney lane we'd re really appreciate it if you took them home with you as you go today um uh, you can begin doing that in about five minutes time so the the pickup period starts at half past but it goes all the way up to quarter two so for those of you who um, uh, want to stay and chat or pray or whatever else you've got 20 minutes of time now that your children are very safe over in Cheney Lane with the team there until you have to pick them up at quarter two 
and uh, our prayer ministry team will, will sort of be available at the front. So if you come to the front, they'd be delighted to find a quiet corner and pray with you. So a final prayer as we go from here. Heavenly Father, thank you for the good news that we've heard today, that there is no fear in death, that Jesus is Lord over all, that he reaches out and touches. Thank you that some of us will have experienced something of breakthrough this morning and others of us will go into this week expectant for that breakthrough to come. And Father, as we go from here, we pray that the peace of God, which passes all understanding, would guard our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and forever. Amen.